I'm Patrick Davidson. On December 4th, 2017, the Thomas Fire ravaged hillsides, farms, and homes throughout Ventura County. Thousands of lives were changed forever. This is one of the inspirational, first-person stories from the community of heroes who came together to fight back, to rescue friends and strangers, and to survive and heal. On this episode of Recaps, our Thomas Fire storyteller is Steve Bennett. Before the disaster hits, it's good to have everybody in a neighborhood recognize you're in it together. We are living in a high disaster risk area. We got fires, we have debris flows, and we have earthquakes um, and the potential for tsunamis. We ought to know that we're going to have to rely on each other in those situations. Get to know your neighbors and really forge that sense of cooperation because you will all be in it together when it happens. And, you know, they talk about you can't count on emergency personnel. I mean, we burned you know, five houses to the ground before the first fire truck got there. You know, that's hours and hours of, of a house being on fire. I'm Steve Bennett, Ventura County Supervisor representing District 1, which is all of Ventura and the Ojai Valley and a slice of Oxnard since 2001, so 17 years. And most people don't know what county government does. Uh, and the biggest challenge is how broad the mandate is for county government. So over $2 billion budget. We implement federal programs, we implement state programs, and we also have the mandate to be like a city. We're a municipal provider in the unincorporated area. So we run the sidewalks and the parks and the streets and all of that, but we also run the food stamp program and the child protective service program. And we manage the funding for the district attorney, for the sheriff, for the county fire department, uh, environmental health. The real challenge in the job is you have to quickly learn a topic and figure out what the essence is in terms of your role in that, in terms of making the decision. What's the right decision? And then, you know, my morning this morning, I just, I'd walk out of one meeting and it was about the general plan. And the next meeting was about how we're gonna handle water in Ventura. And the next meeting was, what are we gonna do about sediment erosion, getting more sediment uh, onto the beach? So it's, it's the rapidity that you have to switch from topic to topic, which makes it really stimulating, but it's, that's also the challenge. My story is actually a blend of being county supervisor and also being a hillside resident. So at 6.30, I received a text from the fire chief, says, 50 acre fire in Santa Paula, I'll keep you posted. And that's very common. Every time there's a fire, the fire chief texts all five supervisors just to let them know. So I had a heads up before almost everybody else that there was something going on, but I had no sense. But I also did also know that the wind was blowing like crazy, that we were in a red flag event. So it wasn't like a text that I would get in the springtime that would say, we've got a river bottom fire or whatever. And you go, no, oh, that almost always gets put out, particularly given the time of year. You went, I hope they can get this one under control because you don't know where it's, where it's going to go. And uh, then, uh, the text came and it's the fire's moving and I started getting text at 8.30 and 9.30 and then along with everybody else I got the notification around about 10.30 I think that this thing is is coming to Ventura and uh, we're gonna have to start evacuation of the east end of Ventura. Is anybody home? I was probably a little bit more alert so I start, was already having conversations. We had at the time, we had about 10 people living in our house. So some of them had already gone to bed. So basically, I woke everybody up, told them, you know, which we're going to have to we're going to have to evacuate. But we had a little time, so it was, was a little calmer than than normal. But also, uh, oh, I, I do remember I was I was reading the eight year old to sleep when the power went out. It was like, oh, power's out time for you to go sleep anyway. I knew there were fires and I thought, you know, maybe a transformer's been hit, et cetera, but not that aware that it was that close. So that was about 10-10, if I remember right. Then about 20 minutes later, I got the, the text. 
Following a massive brush fire, 31,000 acres burned, no containment. One person has died, not burned in the fire, but trying to get away from the fire in an accident. 27,000 people have been evacuated in a number of neighborhoods. So I'm waking that eight-year-old back up and, and uh, other people in the house. And we, we did an early move with the, with the most vulnerable, the pets, the eight-year-old, the people that would have trouble moving out of the house. And then we had a second wave of us go out uh, closer to 1130. Um, and our street is really interesting, but uh, we live on a cul-de-sac. Um, we live up on the hill and the power's out. And I wanted to make sure everybody in the neighborhood was out. Um, and so I started knocking on all the doors. Uh, and it's your sense is everybody's gone because the power's out. You know, you just see, when you see no light in the house and you just think those people are gone. And uh, so what was really sad is that uh, I called one of my neighbors and said, hey, you know, I just got the word. If you don't know, we've got to evacuate. And he said, we're already gone. And so is Brock uh, Jones, who lives across the street from us. So I didn't go to Brock Jones's house because I was told he had, he was, he had already evacuated. That's the one house that I skipped um, and started evacuating, you know, started knocking on all the other doors. Well, in doing that, found another woman two doors down from us, uh, Lynn Weitzel. And she was stuck because with the power being out, her garage door wouldn't open. Um, and she couldn't get her car out. Uh, and she didn't know how to open her door with the automatic opener. So again, all of, everybody was out up to this part of the block. I'm working my way down the block. So I opened up her garage door and then she had to get her dogs and all of that stuff. So that took a little bit of time, I'd say 10, 15 minutes to, for Lynn to get organized and I'm pushing. By the time I got Lynn in her car and I said, now you, you drive down and I'll drive down behind you. And, we're driving down Terrace Drive. There are flames up at the top of Catalina, which is a street up above us. Got her down to where our family had evacuated to and she didn't have a place to go. And then I looked back up and I saw the palm trees on Terrace Drive on fire. And I went, wow. They were really throwing a lot of sparks off, great big tall palm trees. So I went back up uh, on my way to the command center. I told my wife, I'm gonna stop by the house, water the roof down, then I'm gonna go to the command center, which had just been moved to the fairgrounds. When I got onto Terrace Drive, they weren't letting anybody onto Terrace Drive. I walked onto Terrace Drive and um, Terrace Drive was on fire, multiple houses on fire that fast. So I'd been gone 20 minutes. And in that 20 minute time, there were multiple houses on fire on Terrace Drive. I called the fire chief and I said, hey, Terrace Drive's on fire. And he said, hey, he said, every resource is taken. There's not anything we can, we can do for you. So I knew if I left, the whole street would burn because the houses were all below the wind. And so the wind was just gonna blow the fire. And so on the uphill side of the street, uh, there was less damage than the downhill side of the street. They had, they had already, because the, the palm trees blew right onto, the, blew the fire right onto one house and it was igniting these other houses. These other houses on the uphill side of the street, the yards were on fire, the, the decks were on fire, et cetera. So I started grabbing fire hoses and trying to put out the fire. I basically had four houses I was trying to manage. And you couldn't put a fire out very well with a fire hose and 60 mile an hour winds because particularly if they'd gotten a, a good head start on you, because as you would leave it to go to the next house, the wind would just dry it out and the, you know, it would start right back up again. So literally I just ran from house to house, back and forth to these four houses, constantly putting out two of the houses, decks were on fire and balcony was on fire. Um, the one house, their hose had burnt uh, and so it, when I turned on the hose, nothing came out because the hose had melted. So I had to break into that house, get a butcher knife in the dark and cut that hose off. And so I just had like about an eight foot section of hose to try to keep that house under control. So I did that for about an hour and a half. My phone kept ringing. My wife kept wanting me to answer and I could not stop to answer the phone. I was just, if I, if I stopped, if you missed by just a few seconds, one of the houses could get out of control and 
you wouldn't be able to bring it back with the hose. So you, you literally had to calculate as precisely as you could. How long can I stay on this house before I get to that house? But just then, my wife and my um, uh, nephew-in-law, or my nephew, actually, um, came through the smoke and, and, and the embers and helped. And so suddenly, instead of having four houses to manage by myself, you know, we had three of us trying to manage the four houses. And that's the only thing that saved those four houses. I could not have kept the pace up. Uh, you know, the adrenaline was, I was, it was an hour and a half. I wasn't in that great a shape. So uh, we got the, we, we kept that under control. Meanwhile, the five houses across the street from us all completely in blaze. Uh, and it felt like a combat zone, loud pops and, and all kinds of noise going on. Um, very bright uh, and, uh, we kept going down. One of the five houses hadn't d appeared to maybe it wasn't on, but it was on fire inside, but not outside. You couldn't tell for sure. We kept running forays down in there for as long as we could last. I remember my lips were all chapped and everything. Um, but you could only last about 15 seconds because you only had about five or six feet between the two houses, you know, that are on fire and stuff. Once those houses we got the we got our houses under control, and those houses had burned down enough that you went. Uh, it looks like we're not going to burn down. The house behind us catches on fire, <laughs> so we pull the hoses up to the, on our roof, and that's when our water goes out. So our water pressure goes out. So I started fighting fire about 12:30, uh, and this is about 3:30. So about three hours, and no water in the hoses, and it. I just thought we we're going to lose it for sure. Um, and at about four o'clock, we were just putting, running around, stamping on embers, trying to put them out because we just didn't have any water. Um, and at four o'clock, my wife was in front monitoring the four, the front yard while we were working in the backyard, my, my nephew and myself. And the Orange County fire truck pulled up, saw those houses were beyond saving on that side. It looked like our houses were under control and they were leaving. And she said, no, you can't leave. The house behind us is on fire. And the wind was blowing directly at the four houses we had just saved. So they pulled hose up. And fortunately, the fire hydrant on our street still had water, even though our hose didn't. And I don't understand why. Um, and they were able to soak everything down and back. And just about then, it was getting close to 5 o'clock. And the sun came up, and we collapsed, you know, just literally exhausted from, from that. But the four houses were, were still standing. But unfortunately, the house behind us burned down. And then I kind of had to put my supervisor's hat back on, because I was supposed to be at the command center <laughs> you know, at, uh, at midnight. And so we pulled an all-nighter then, and then I started getting briefings from the uh, from the fire chief, uh, the, the sheriff came by, the CEO, they walked up the street. Um, but we had to stay and keep working on the spot fire aspect and you know, still being windy and, and all that. So we immediately that day cut down all the fire brush around us. We, had, we cut down uh, six major trees in our neighbor's backyard. Three of them were dead with our neighbor's permission and stuff. Uh, and. Uh, we spent the whole day just trying to clean up all the flammable material on all four of those houses that were left um, and stripped that stuff down pretty well uh, and then kind of held our breath that night when uh, the winds were really kicking up again and, and we stayed up that night and by the next morning we were absolutely cooked. There had been two nights where maybe we had just catnapped for a half hour. So we got some sleep and then the neighborhood felt more under control. But I was certainly very conscious of all of, I could, I could relate with everybody who had been burned out or been almost burned out and stuff. So it was then going to work with our, our teams to help people. And at the same time, we had the fire marching through the rest of the county and moving up to Santa Barbara. and. Uh, so we had to deal with those things. But you know, a lot of questions were really coming in from the neighbors. Why weren't we evacuated faster? Why did the tanks of water run out in, in the city of Ventura? And it's pretty hard to get many of those questions. So it was trying to emphasize to people, some of the stuff's gonna have to get answered after the incident. Right now, we've gotta take care of the incident. But our county staff was remarkable. They had already started uh, within hours of the fire hitting the city of Ventura, our county staff had contacted the state, 
had already started to have the, the recovery teams, the debris removal teams, et cetera, mobilized. The lack of, of territoriality, the lack of silos, the willingness, and that comes, quite frankly, from them building trust with each other well in advance of this fire. In other words, they've, they've been working on this for years, realizing they've got to, they have to work together. And there are a lot of counties where that does not happen. There's a real struggle between uh, different departments and you know, for resources, for authority, for who gets to make the decision. And there's, there's a real absence of that here, and it's to everybody's credit. We all benefit as a result of that, but that's real professionalism when you can set your ego aside and go, we gotta do what's best here. It was the fastest moving fire in California history. There was no scenario that would say a fire breaking out in Santa Paula at 6.30 is gonna be burning down 400 homes in the city of Ventura, 700 homes total, but 400 in the city of Ventura that night. There's not a fire scenario, now there is. There's a, a, a model for that. So the fastest moving fire, but it was the fastest evacuation in spite of people's frustrations with it. Uh, they did a remarkable job. And I probably think one of the biggest things that, that has, has come from this is this was an opportunity for government employees to demonstrate how valuable government is, how valuable professional employees that really get after it um, are to a community. And these people, I think, have really helped restore faith in, in county government and in city government, that there are a lot of people that really care about the, the job that they have, and they, they worked incredibly hard to, you know, particularly in that first 48 hours or so, incredibly hard to try to, and far more people would have been in real trouble uh, had they not done what they'd done. And it just goes all the way across the board. It, the, the, the fire people anticipating and started calling in emergency teams before you know, the fire actually was hitting in Ventura. The people in environmental health and, and the public works people, pre-positioning equipment and, and stuff. Now, that's the other thing, that another observation I would have is your safety is not just your fire department and your police department. They're absolutely essential and really important. Boy, those people in public health and those people in environmental health, you know, I just was at a presentation this morning and, you know, people in the public health department in Santa Barbara were searching and trying to pull out dead bodies in the debris basins while they were cleaning them. And um, so it takes a full county government and that whole complement to work. So in terms of hard decisions, staff was working so well that there weren't that many hard decisions. Emergency staff is empowered. They've got to make the decisions and keep us informed. And so from that standpoint, I could not be more proud to be a, a, a county employee because of how well they handled it. And so they were on it in terms of starting the debris removal and getting that all set up and having the teams come down. And so while up in Santa Rosa still today, they have properties that have not been cleared. We have every property has been cleared, and I'm sure you've heard this from some of the other people that, that, that you've talked to, but every property has been cleared that wanted to have the public debris removal program that was set up. And that was a great program for most people. For a few people, it, wasn't, it wouldn't be great for them, and they chose not to do it. But for the average person, all the liability was taken off of them. They got everything done. And all they had to do was sign over the part of their insurance policy that was dedicated to the debris removal. You know, I, I think that psychological relief when the debris was gone, I still felt under siege as long as I saw those burnt out frames of those buildings. And I felt like I was truly in, in healing mode only when all of those burned out frames, you know. In my mind, it was the closest to what I imagined hand-to-hand -hand combat would be that night. There are some specific takeaways about notification. There are two kinds of calls that went out to notify people. There were the calls that went out to people that had signed up for the system to be notified. They got called around 1030. At 1130, they, they used what they call the nuclear bomb. And that is where your cell phone screeches. It can't be as narrowly focused, so it goes to virtually everybody in Ventura, and it was, you know, be alert, there's a lot going on, start paying attention. But it couldn't say evacuate specifically because it was going to a far broader area than where they wanted to have evacuate. 
That's not the system you want to rely on. That's the true nuclear emergency. You know, you need to be signed up for the other system. So one big takeaway is what I would like to have, and I'm lobbying to try to get state law changed, is to make that an opt out system. So you don't have to go opt in. It's just human nature. People don't make that phone call to the sheriff and, and do that. But almost all of the problems that I've had from people not being notified, there are people that have not opted in to the notification system. It's sort of redundant. Everybody keeps saying this, but it's being prepared. And the first thing about being prepared is how are you going to get notified? Well, get into that system until we get state law changed. I've been reviewing with them. When did you know what? When did you notify? I'm not finding any major major flaws in that, but that's that's one, right? Um, a second one is, you know, for the city of Ventura, the whole issue of the water tanks and, and all of that, and that's still to be resolved. So that's a that's a takeaway in terms of what kind of preparations you have to have, because firefighters literally left houses that they could have saved because they had no water. And, you know, they're instructed, you, you know, you, you can't do much as a firefighter if you don't have that. And they would go someplace else where there was water and they could they could do more good. So making sure that we have that water flow as best we can and there's there's no foolproof system um, would be really, uh, would be a takeaway. The more global, you know, conceptual besides, you know, Individuals need to be ready, um, and, and some of these specific things that are out there, it is to emphasize the, the great value of the professionalism that comes from training exercises where you actually do practice cooperation. So you, you don't just know who to call, but you have a relationship with that person who you've got to call to say, Trust me, you got to evacuate. Because I'll tell you, you do an evacuation. We saw it up in Montecito. You know, after the slide, then about two weeks later, they evacuated everybody again, and nothing happened. Already, some of those citizens were saying, well, I'm not going to evacuate next time because nothing happened. You know, it, it is, you know, for emergency personnel, they don't want people... Uh, to become desensitized to a de evacuation orders uh, because they want them to work. So it's not a question of convenience. It's a question of using that tool to save the most people in the long run. And overusing that tool actually puts everybody at risk. And so those are, those are difficult things. But it's the, it's the cooperation, I think, uh, 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 and the relationship building so that um, people know who to, who to talk to at the state. You have a relationship with, at the state. They have confidence that you're not, uh, you know, crying wolf. Uh, that's the biggest takeaway I think that that's come from this. Another takeaway: um, it's been our neighborhood is a closer knit neighborhood as a result of the fire. People are more sensitive to each other. They're more willing to check with each other before they do something, help each other out. It's a good reminder that before the disaster hits, it's good to have everybody in a neighborhood recognize you're in it together. We are living in a high disaster risk area. We got fires, we have debris flows, and we have earthquakes. Um, and the potential for tsunamis. We ought to know that we're gonna have to rely on each other at those situations. Get to know your neighbors and really forge that sense of cooperation because you will all be in it together when it happens. And you know, they talk about you can't count on emergency personnel. I mean, we burned you know, five houses to the ground before the first fire truck got there. You know, That's hours and hours of, of a house being on fire. We didn't all have each other's cell phones. If I would have had the cell phones of some of those people, they may have been able to get up there and, and add some more manpower and save a few more houses, you know, but I didn't have, I, I knew them, I had their landline, but I didn't have their cell phone. Now I've got the cell phone of, of everybody in the neighborhood. And now in terms of the rebuilding effort, you know, trying to make it as flexible and as, as convenient and as easy as possible, and yet at the same time still protect the public health and make sure that, um, you know, incredible things have to happen in terms of making sure your neighbors, you don't build in such a way that you disadvantage your neighbor and you don't take advantage of the fire to disadvantage your neighbor, but at the same time try to let you build as quickly as you can. And we're dealing with that, but within, you know, between December and June, it was an incredible six months. We are in, I think, far better shape than anybody else who's gone through this experience, any other county. And certainly we hear that across the board in the state. They just go, hey, nobody pulled it together like Ventura County has pulled it together for this effort.